chapter six in the story of the eighth doctor brings us to one of the most exciting sections of the eighth doctor adventures novel range here we would i would call this the compassion arc uh, named after the companion named compassion who shows up through the next several books uh, we're looking at books 25 through 31 this is late 1999 into early 2000 and this starts with a very unusual thing perhaps unique the book interference is actually two volumes they were released together it's just you know part one part two basically um, but i've never seen that in a novel in a doctor who novel before so that's interesting uh, and and it's suitably epic it's it's a really big pair of stories uh sort of woven together and yes it's actually two different two different stories that work together and if, if you're familiar with new who class um, new who on television stephen moffat in particular became popularly known for his tiny wimey stories uh, where you, know, you meet River Song and the Doctor sees her die, and then he meets her for her first time later, and their timelines are all mixed up. Um, things like that, you know, the cause and effect of things are not necessarily in chronological order. It's like that with interference in spades. It has the Eighth Doctor with Sam and Fitz um, on Earth in 1996, I believe it was, and there they meet up with Sarah Jane Smith and K-9, so that's fun. Um, but they're investigating some alien arms deals to help out UNIT, and there's all this stuff going on. Lots of stuff going on. But there's also um, another plot going on with the third Doctor, with Sarah Jane Smith, on this really you know, collapsing, fall apart sort of planet called Dust. And there they meet a strange character named I.M. Foreman, who, by the way, uh, is who's that that's the name of the junkyard on in on Totters Lane where Doctor Who started. Um, so that's an interesting little concept there. Um, but anyway, so this is a huge story and it's hard to summarize it without spending an inordinate amount of time on it. Uh, but basically what happens is we meet a new, well not new, but we, we meet a significant enemy or um, yeah, opponent here, Faction Paradox. They were introduced in Alien Bodies, a previous book, book six in the novel range, so earlier on. Um, but now they show up and they are a very active and very dangerous group of Time Lords. Um, basically, Faction Paradox is a sort of like the voodoo magic priest-ish kind of take on Time Lord society rather than going the scientific route as we normally see with Time Lords. Um, and what they do is they work with sort of um, minor organizations that they set up. They give them a little bit of technology and let them do their bidding in small and sneaky ways. And one such organization along these lines that we come across here is called The Remote. Um, there's a lot of you could puns, I guess, basically you could call it, um, but you know, plays on words, uh, interference, you know, the, the remote travel through static in a sense. And yeah, remote as in remote control, it's kind of like that. Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting set of stories here. Uh, very, very heavy on the metaphor of the media and how the media affects the way that we think and the way that we understand reality and perceive reality. Um, the remote is basically a character, a caricature, a, a placeholder for that societal problem that we have. The remote is an organization where people have earpieces that connect them to the media, the waves, the airwaves around them, and that is how they think. That is how they make their decisions. That is how they figure out what's going on and what to do. And so when you have a couple agents of the remote sent to 1996 Earth, they have to stay very focused on what their mission is because the signals that, that they're picking up there on Earth 
are completely different to them. And they start, you know, picking up cultural references and things on the news and you know, all these weird things. Um, so it, it's a very, very interesting concept. And whatever your feelings are about mass media or um, the way that we think and are impacted by the music and the television and the radio and all the things that we surround ourselves with, um, whatever you think about all that, it's a very, very interesting story. Um, some people are very conspiratorial, some people are not so bothered, but it, it, it makes you think, and that's a very, very interesting and good thing. Anyway, a lot happens in this story. Um, Sam Jones leaves. She is on Earth within three years of her home, of her home time, so she stays with Sarah Jane Smith and uh, won't rejoin her family until she reaches when the time that she left in 2000 or thereabouts. Um, and it's funny because, you know, she's already aged three years. She's going to age a couple more years by the time she um, gets home. So she'll just have to write it off to going through puberty <laughs> or something like that. It was kind of funny. Um, but a lot of other crazy things happen. The doctor gets a rewrite of his past. Um, in the third Doctor segments of this pair of books, he suffers an, at an attack from Faction Paradox on the planet Dust, led by one Father Kreiner, who is Fitz, aged a thousand or two thousand years, working for the remote because he was captured in the Eighth Doctor segment of this story and was never rescued. So that's uh, an interesting shock that comes out of all of this. Um, but that's sort of eclipsed by the fact that how can you rewrite a Doctor's regeneration story? Uh, how can the Third Doctor get a different regeneration story here? That's a huge paradox. Oh, faction paradox. This is what they're all about. Basically, their whole goal is to make the Doctor one of their agents. And so they've infected him with this sort of par faction paradox virus, which will take control of him after a few more regenerations. Um, so they go after him at, in his third incarnation, such that the eighth incarnation will become their, um, their slave unable to resist their bidding. So that's a very interesting, very interesting idea and concept. And so that sets up um, a big question of what's going to happen next. How is the Eighth Doctor going to handle this? Is he going to succumb or what? Um, meanwhile, we meet a couple new characters, the agents of the remote, Code and Compassion. And these both turn out to be uh, new versions or iterations of humans that joined the remote years ago, centuries ago. Code turns out to be Fitz, and Compassion, some other person that he met um, when he was captured by the remote. And so this is a very important thing that sets up for the rest of this, for this arc that we're looking at, this concept of remembering. Uh, the remote have they don't reproduce, uh, their members don't have sex and have babies. They, when they die, their bodies are collected into this sort of biomass regeneration tank. People gather together, remember as much as they can about the person, and this tank then takes the biomass, spits out a person, gives them the memories based on what the people who knew that person knew about this person and boom, you got a new person. So it's a bit like the loom concept but, um, from uh, previous books about the Time Lords, how they re uh, regenerate, <laughs> how they uh, uh, ge generate new people. I totally lost the word there for some reason, but you know, how they have babies, they, they have looms to do this. Uh, it's very, very similar concept here. Uh, it's just being used for, for ordinary people, for humans. And this is critical because what you get, what, it's like the game of telephone. Interference sets in. Over time, people become more and more stereotyped versions of who they used to be. So code is sort of the, the 
descendant of Code Boy, which Fitz was named um, because apparently working with Code was one of his things when he worked for the remote after he was captured. Uh, so we got Code and we got Compassion. And so at the very end, the doctor takes one of the you know remotes, remembrance machine tank thingies, and he uses the TARDIS to reshape Code with the memories of Fitz, as far as he and the TARDIS can remember Fitz. So now we've got Fitz back. He's a remake of the original, and throughout this arc, there's going to be the occasional worry from Fitz himself. Am I real? Was I put back together correctly? Who, you know, who am I? Am I the right, you know, am I really me? And that, that's going to haunt him for a while. And it's a very interesting situation for him. Um, compassion, however, doesn't have the benefit that Fitz does of an original imprint for the TARDIS or the Doctor to try and remember. So now we've got Compassion sort of recovering from the remote and trying to become her own person who doesn't need to rely on the signals around her anymore. She still has her earpiece, but the doctor is, has doctored it. Ha ha ha. Um, so that now it lists, now the TARDIS is sort of filtering what signal she takes in. He's trying to shape her into her own person and help her become human, I guess, in a way. So who she is and how she develops is one of the key features of this arc of these several books now. I spend a long time dealing with, you know, 10 minutes talking about this first book, um, but that's because it's such an important setup for what follows. And so from here, we have five more books uh, that be that carry this arc through. Uh, the first book is the in, in number 27 in the whole range is called The Blue Angel. And this is, in a way, it's not a Doctor Who book. It's an Iris Wild Time book featuring the Doctor. And it's a very confusing book because it's dealing with a very confused Doctor and a very confused situation. He is reeling uh, from the events of certain parts of this story. There's a dreamscape section of this book that comes in and out, and it's very difficult for the reader, first time reader at least, to make sense of who is who and what's going on. There's like a dreamscape alternate reality version of everything, and you're never really sure if this is an analogy for what's happened in the book interference beforehand, or um, if this is some sort of like future if time flashing back to the events in this story. There's a very obvious Star Trek spoof going on, uh, and then there's this enclave pocket dimension, which is part of the obverse, which connects lots of different universes together, uh, and it's lots and lots of ideas, and some of them are very strange. Like, you get giant owls attacking old ladies in a shopping mall in Britain. It's like, okay. Um, but it's it's really sort of just capturing the craziness of this of what has been going on with the doctor and the situation with faction paradox and this idea of recovery and and worry about the future. Um, it'll be I should go and reread it sometime uh, with more context and see what happens. See what I can make sense of it better this time. So anyway, that's a more introspective sort of book. This next one is called The Taking of Planet Five, and it would be very helpful if you were familiar with the TV story um, Image of the Fendal uh, before picking up this book. I hadn't watched that that show in, the, in, in many, many years, if I actually watched it at all. It's a fourth Doctor story. It's one of the sort of horror-type stories from his era. And uh, Planet Five is what... It, we now know is the asteroid belt. Uh, it is where the Time Lords imprisoned a terrible creature called the Fendal, which is almost released in that fourth Doctor story I mentioned. Um, but anyway, what's happening here is that the Fendal has somehow escaped what the Doctor tried to do to it, and it is out um, trying to destroy things. It, it, it feeds on life. It is a creature or a being of death. Um, so it's, you know, virtually unstoppable because you can't kill something that is dead it's worse than it's like an insubst incorporeal vampire in that regard so that's kind of 
awful. But The Taking of Planet Five is a very, very interesting book, and it's one of my absolute favorites, I have to say, uh, because this is, well, many reasons why. One of the reasons is that this is our first real in-depth look at the future time war that the Eighth Doctor has encountered in alien bodies and heard about a little bit in Interference again. And now he comes across two Time Lord agents from his future who are actually fighting in this time war. Not two, a whole team of them. Um, and and there's there so many different things going on in this book. Again, there are the there's this Time Lord hit squad that's trying to um, wipe out these Lovecraftian creatures in prehistoric Earth, and they're trying to breed some battle tardises there on Earth before the enemy, whoever they are, can can detect them. There are a couple agents called C Celestes, um, who we learn are from the Celestial Intervention Agency. Now, that's a, a piece of Time Lord society that apparently left Gallifrey at the beginning of the war to go hide in their own little bubble universe called Mictlan, which is basically hell in Time Lord mythology. So there's a lot of very interesting things going on. The science fiction behind this book is very speculative, but very seriously taken. Um, you get to deal with the concept of universe, bubble universe, and bubbles of universes that exist around each other, and the concept of swimmers, um, either a rogue universe or some sort of thing, force, creature that swims around and occasionally pops a universe and just sort of breaks it apart. And the Fendal is likened to that kind of creature. And so there's this whole plot going on about trying to save the universe from this threat, this existential threat of the swimmers, and the Eighth Doctor is sort of caught up in all this, but he does an amazing job of trying to avoid spoilers, as it were, trying to you know keep away knowledge of his people's future. Um, so that's a very interesting book, and the one of the authors even has a little science paper of sorts at the very end, just to sort of describe and put together this idea of bubble universes and finite infinite universes. <laughs> it's very interesting. If you're into science fiction, it's the science of science fiction, um, this is one of the really, really good books of the Eighth Doctor range. Uh, this is followed by two more books, um, which are a little bit lighter, but uh, in, in terms of scale, but um, things continue to escalate through them. Book 29 is Frontier Worlds. Uh, this is in many ways a very a more normal Doctor Who story. There's a corrupt corporation. It's being in, run by an alien intelligence, a, a space traveling plant, as it turns out. Um, Fitz gets a romance story while he and Compassion are undercover as Frank and and Nancy Sinatra, uh, so that's hilarious. Um, this is, again, you know, I think I've mentioned this previously, Fitz has a thing for aff affecting false identities, and so sometimes he goes for James Bond, sometimes Frank Sinatra, um, so, you know, things like that. He's, he's very fun, and he actually narrates about two-thirds of the book, Frontier Worlds. He, it turns out he two-thirds of the way through the book, he and Compassion finally meet up with the Doctor again after like three or four weeks on this planet, Drebnar, and he is catching the Doctor up on what has happened. So that's sort of the justification for why he has been narrating so much of the book up to that point. It's also helpful for us, the audience, because Fitz's understanding of technology is much closer to ours than to Compassion's. Compassion's from the far future. She knows a lot of techno babble. Fitz is from 1960 something, so he's, um, you know, <laughs> he looks at a microwave oven. He says it looks a bit like a television, you know, things like that. So, here, hearing this future Earth colony described by Fitz is very helpful for us, and it's a very interesting way of going about it. Also, the author is very, very descriptive, so you get a sense of how stinky one of these main characters are, and and what compassion looks like and, and, and what the world around them is like. So it's, it's a, in terms of writing clarity and writing style, Frontier Worlds really stands out. It's pretty neat. 
Um, it's followed by Parallel 59, where Fitz gets another romance story with like three women. It, it's beginning to get a little weird because it's almost the exact same thing happens over it again. But Parallel 59 is a very different situation. There you're on a planet which is locked in the terrible Cold War of sorts, um, but Fitz gets trapped in an alternate, or not an alternate reality, um, a virtual reality. And apparently there's this whole setup of bastions, these sort of space stations orbiting the planet, which one of the parallels, Parallel 59, has installed to stop the other parallels on the planet from building their own space programs. But they're also, everyone there is super xenophobic and paranoid about aliens. And it's so played up that you kind of assume that this is a, a hoax. But towards the end, they are very real. And they actually have taken over the bastion where Fitz is located. And the destruction that takes place at the end of this book is incredible. Like the, the entire planet is bombed and there are hundreds of survivors total. <laughs> so that's um, shocking for, for a Doctor Who story. Normally the Doctor and companions save the day. In this one, they don't. They save a few people and that's about it. Anyway, I, I, I run those two books Frontier Worlds and Parallel 59 together because they're very similar in many ways, and but also because the thing that really connects them is compassion. She is developing. At first, uh, in the first couple stories, she's totally bland. Compassion is like an ironic name for her because she ha- has no passion at all. She doesn't care about anything. I mean, she's practical. She's pragmatic. She does what needs to be done and does it well. But she And she knows how to act happy and how to act sad, but she doesn't know why she should. Um, in the course of these books, she explores her humanity little bit by bit, but there's also hints that something is happening. S- somehow she is changing, and this is not just her becoming more human. This is not just her discovering emotions or self-guided thinking, but something more fundamental about her is changing. It's an interesting and perplexing mystery. We get hints of it in Taking of Planet 5. She's able to communicate, and she's able to pilot the TARDIS, first of all, which is unusual for a companion. Uh, she gets along with the battle TARDISes from the future extremely well, which is weird. The Doctor gets along with them too, which is slightly less surprising. But then in Frontier Worlds, um, you know, when she's entangled with people for the long haul, um, we start getting inside her head a little bit there, and we start seeing more of how she, you know, skills that she has and things that she can do and knowledge that she's got. And then in Parallel 59, things are taken to the next level. She and the Doctor are captured on the planet, and they are, you know, scanned. Their bodies are scanned to identify them. Are these the creepy aliens? And for once, for once, the Doctor having two hearts uh, is not an abnormality for this particular planet. Hmm, lucky him. They still recognize him as an alien, but not, not quite what they expected. Compassion, however, when she goes through the scanning machine, it literally blows up. There is too much information in her for it to handle, and it just overloads. So that's weird. How did this ordinary human suddenly have such complicated biodata? So that's the big question, and we get the answer to this, who compassion is or what this changes, in the last book of this arc, The Shadows of Avalon. This book relies on you partly relies on you knowing about um, what happened to the Brigadier in in another book, which I have not read, hadn't read then, still haven't read. Um, I believe it's it's the last of the New Adventures novels, um, which featured the, which happened to feature the Eighth Doctor. Um, It has Benny, Benny Summerfield in it, it has the Brigadier in it, and apparently he was rejuvenated or something like that. 
So he's back to his 1970s-ish age, apparently, I think. Uh, basically, he's given a new lease on life, uh, so he can exist in 1990s and beyond. This is an idea, obviously, that seems not to have been picked up in the Sarah Jane adventures, where we see the brigadier reappear, and then when he passes away, when the actor passed away, and that is a very appropriate thing. Um, so Shadows of Avalon is a bit of an aberration in the canon. It doesn't really fit very well with what was then established later on television, but let's just roll with it. So he's younger. Um, his wife, Doris, has just passed away. He's in mourning. He's having a hard time dealing with this. And then an atomic bomb disappears. It just vanish it's it, it the pi the the fighter sh uh, fighter ship the fighter um airplane carrying it just vanishes over the airspace of britain then the tardis arrives and it blows up and the doctor and compassion and fits are scattered throughout this sort of shadow realm called avalon and it's a parallel dimension earth kind of like uh, where we met the shia in Autumn Mist. Uh, different reality, but similar concept. So now we've got this weird situation where there is a fissure between Avalon and, and Earth. And things are, are not looking good in Avalon. The Celtic descendants, humans, are being antagonized with the fairies in the north. And it turns out that there are a couple interventionists who are there trying to provoke war. And these interventionists are kind of sadistic. And it's a man and a woman, and they're lovers, but they're sadistic. They want to kill people, they want people to kill each other. And we learn that they are Time Lords. They've been sent here by Romana, who's the Lady President of Gallifrey, and sent by Romana in her third incarnation, so this is a new thing that we haven't heard before. And they're after something very important. We don't know what it is for a while, but eventually we find out they're after compassion. Compassion's change really escalates throughout this book. There are a couple of moments where she sort of blends into her surroundings when she feels threatened and people can't find her, can't see her. There's a time when she's invisible. There's a time when she disappears and reappears somewhere else to avoid a you know, cave-in or some sort of ceiling collapse. She starts knowing things that she is sure she did not know before or never actually learned. Something is happening and this is really beginning to scare her. So this is where we really see compassion becoming human very emotionally human for the first time, but it's because she's fighting this change, whatever it is. So we've got the doctor and the brigadier and Fitz, they're rushing about in this Avalon situation and the brigadier set, set, finds his way in there too and he's trying to get the, the, the atomic bomb back safely. Um, the intervention, the Time Lord interventionists want that bomb to explode and start a war and it's a huge mess. Fortunately, the doctor gets Queen Mab of the fairies on, yes, I'm pretty sure that's correct, on, on board with him and, and they, they do a good job of trying to, of settling peace in Avalon and the brigadier is able to, you know, bro eventually gets on board with this peace agreement as well. He's oddly nationalistic in this story, like he's really interested in, in the interests of Britain throughout most of this book, so that's a bit of a weird angle for him. But finally, towards the end of this story, it happens. The interventionists are trying to capture compassion, and she gets pushed off of the tower of a castle, and she's falling to her death. And she really doesn't want to do this, but she has to save her own life. So you hear the, the sound of a TARDIS dematerializing, and she's disappeared. So this goes back all the way to Interference at the beginning of the story arc, where she had that earpiece from the remote. She took her cues from the signals around her. 
once you started traveling with the doctor, all those signals are being filtered by the TARDIS. She is being changed and informed by the signals of the TARDIS itself. She is becoming a TARDIS. <laughs> um, she becomes the first humanoid TARDIS, the Type 102, if I remember correctly. Um, so we've seen this before. We saw uh, in Alien Bodies and in The Taking of Planet 5 a Time Lord from the future with a humanoid TARDIS named Marie. I think she's identified as a Type 103. Romana has sent these interventionists, and eventually she shows up herself in person to take compassion back to Gallifrey, not back, well, to capture her, take her to Gallifrey, and breed her to make new battle TARDISes. Because through the Doctor's escapades in the obverse back in the Blue Angel, the Time Lords have become all the more aware of this imposing threat of a time war in their future that will be devastating, and Romana wants them to be ready. And she is no nonsense about this. She's not taking any risks. I want all the weapons and all the resources I can get my hands on to save Gallifrey. So there's that. Needless to say, perhaps, uh, the Doctor and Fitz catch up with uh, compassion and they run away. So now the TARDIS, the Doctor's TARDIS, does really seem to be destroyed. There is no recovering it at the end. The Doctor and Fitz run off in a new TARDIS, in, in compassion. And boy is it weird <laughs> having a humanoid TARDIS who can, you know, talk to you and look like a normal person on the outside and sort of speak to you and interact with you on the inside um, with a disembodied voice and that she can control the inside her inner her, her insides her interior dimensions um, much more autonomously than a normal TARDIS could it's a very interesting concept it's a very interesting take on Time Lord technology and I guess we do see hints of this idea um, in later Doctor Who canon I'm trying to remember where exactly, but anyway, we'll save that for the next chapter, I suppose. This is one of the tightest parts of the novel range, these few books. From Interference to the Shadows of Avalon, it's very, very focused on this development of compassion and the beginning of the exploration of what has happened to the Eighth Doctor in light of Faction Paradox. And at the end of this series, of this little sequence of books, the Doctor and Fitz are now on the run with compassion. They're just trying to keep her away from the Time Lords who want to capture her and use her. So it's a new, it's a new, new situation for the Eighth Doctor and um, a very, very different scenario for him. Now he's on the run from his own people in a much more urgent sense. And so the next chapter that we'll deal with next time um, is the Fugitives arc, telling the stories of how they are trying to stay away from and evade Time Lord capture. So just in case Interference, uh, the two-part two book, wasn't groundbreaking enough, this whole arc plays out into some pretty big game changers for the Doctor Who franchise. So welcome to 2002, or to, to the year 2000, I should say. And uh, this is an exciting time for the novels. We'll have to see what happens next.